on the fly as you went along? Anybody remember any of that? Every day. No, well, <laughs> we changed some well, key things, but mostly yeah. we worked <laughs> off the script. But it didn't fall on me to do the script. What happened was that, you know, George and I were like working on ideas and putting things together. And then George got tied up with a commercial client that only wanted him to direct their thing. Well, the way, just like the way we worked, if one person couldn't do something, yeah, so we the stuck next, somebody else picked up the ball and kept running. I was afraid that if we got stymied and couldn't do anything on the script for three or four weeks, the project would die, just like yeah, other projects. It, yeah, started. something else would get involved. So all I wanted to do was keep it going and make sure we actually made a movie. Because if we lost the summer shooting weather, we'd be sunk, you know. Yeah, that was the other thing. Pittsburgh weather, you only had three or four months. You either shot or you didn't. If fall came, you're done. Right, you once the leaves change. So I just picked it up and ran with it. And that's, that's basically how it got done. I guess my point was more to the fact that there were, were every day there were refinements. Um, and, and there was something learned, uh, you know, it, it wasn't like a typical uh, production where, you know, you have location scouts and you go out and you block the thing out and you figure out how you're gonna, you know, what, no, it's like everybody's thrown into this house and now figure it out. Yeah. That's exactly the way it happened. There was no time for any, any real pre-production, uh, almost non-existent, I would yeah, say. Yeah, and again, because other people were tied up, Russ was probably tied up producing something, and Gary and I, we, we go rent a truck and go to Goodwill, and you can't do that, that. Now we got a whole truck full of furniture for 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, go to Goodwill now, <laughs> you know, you're gonna pay right. three or 400 bucks an item. We got the carpets, we got everything in there, in there and then people contributed stuff. Well, on, on the most uh, elemental level, any film, any film, um, you have to start with your, with obviously with a script, and then you have to find the right kind of locations. In the case of Night of the Living Dead, <clears throat> ordinarily, if someone wants to rent your house to film a movie, the deal is that they will leave your house in as good or better condition than they found it. In the case of Night of the Living Dead, we weren't exactly sure how much damage the house was going to endure. So, we, that put on a special kind of uh, consideration related to the location. We got very lucky, there was an, uh, an intern working for us by the name of Jack Ligo in the commercial business. And we start talking about this idea, where are we going to find a farmhouse uh, that we can basically do considerable damage to. Jack Ligo pops up and he said, you know, uh, I used to go to a summer camp in Evans City, and I think right adjacent to the, the, the uh, summer camp, uh, there was a farmhouse that nobody's living in. So uh, we got in touch with the owner, uh, Mr. Gass, in Evans City, and it turns out that he was, he owned the house, and he didn't care what happened to it, to the property, because uh, in a few months, it was his intention, in a few months, he was going to bulldoze the house, he was going to raise it, and grow turf, as a turf farm there. So when I spoke to Mr. Gass, I said, now please understand, anything could happen, parts of the house may even be burned. We don't know exactly yet what's gonna happen. Fine, we made a deal for the summer of 1967 that we could do anything to that house. Now, once we had that prime location, then we found a nearby cemetery the only the only scene that were, the only scenes that were not filmed in that farmhouse were two. Uh, number one, we wanted to make the story seem bigger than just southwestern Pennsylvania, so we piled into a caravan of three cars and went on a Sunday afternoon to Washington D.C. and filmed uh, the Washington D.C. sequence, which is a sequence that George Romero appeared in as a reporter, and I filmed that sequence, okay? Washington handled. 
The other scenes that were not filmed in the house were the scenes in the basement. They were filmed in our office building in downtown Pittsburgh because the basement of the house was just simply too shallow to get lights and equipment and us in there. So we had to find a different basement. Mm -hmm. But the finding the key location that we could basically destroy was the key to make all the other things happen. So now we have a location and we have a, an outline script and a real script. So you come in, but now you know where you are and you have to, that part of it you have to make up as you go. Okay, here's the blocking. We have to do this. This is the upstairs, here's the downstairs, here's the whatever. But a lot of that is made up on the fly. At least it was in the case of, of our, our uh, situation. Yeah, talking about on the fly here, real quickly, I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'll direct this one to Gary, even though it's Russ and Gary's mom. But wasn't the car that Johnny and Barbara drove in your mom's car? And, and you shot the graveyard scene in two places, and and in between that, it was dented. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. She so, had an, an so it had to be on the fly. We had to kind of push the car into the tree to match the dent. So that's well, true. that's exactly that's exactly what happened. This was her day to day car. Uh, it was it was a perfect car for this brother and sister. It was just happened to be sort of right in the correct economic range that these two would have, and it was free. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, as as Ken said, we we uh, the cemetery was the first and the last thing that we shot, and uh, over that summer, close to when we were supposed to be shooting, the car was in an accident, and uh, you know we had a really good friend that was a body man, and it's like, okay, we'll we'll Butch George will do that. We'll do it overnight. We'll get it because we were all worried that. The, the, film, the car had to be in, and George is no, 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 leave it the way it is. This is great, he said, because I've been grappling with this idea how we how we slow the car down in, in order to, you know, keep the drama going here, because otherwise, if it's going, it would have just been gone, and it would have been done. There'd been no back and forth. So it was like, no, 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 don't get it filled. We'll, we'll run it into a tree. That's exactly what happened. Russ can fi finish the other, my, so came the premiere, Right, my mother obviously knew that the car. She knew it was wrecked, so she knew it, it never even really hit the tree. To me, it's one of the hokier parts in *The Living Dead*, <laughs> but that's just—it's fine. It works. Yeah, it uh, did, yeah, like I said, it slowed everything down. Exactly, it, it, it worked. So anyway, Russ, while we're at the premiere, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll. You want yeah, me to? So, so Moss Driner. Knew, she knew all the stuff about, yeah, the damage, already damaged car was run into a tree. What she didn't know uh, until the premiere was that Bill Heinzman was going to pick up a rock and blast out the passenger <laughs> side window so he could get at Barbara. Well, her clever younger son, Gary, went through his pals, found a replacement window so when Bill Heinzman blew the window out, Gary and Gary and uh, I, I don't know if you got Butch George to help with yeah, uh, uh, to replace the window. So here we are at the screening and um, my mother, yeah, she knew what was going on. She was also a, a, a ghoul in the film. So she knew a little bit about the location, what was going on. What she didn't know was Bill Heinzman blew out the passenger window. That came as a surprise to her the night of the premiere. <laughs> I was thinking about what Gary said about things that we changed and it, I was kind of wrestling with that because his memory was a little different than mine, but then I happened to think, well, one of the things we were doing was inventing these fleshy ghouls, which had never been done before. So. In my case, I just figured, well, they're going to have some rigor mortis, you know, so they move slowly and stiffly. And when it came to do my part, I figured that Carl Hardman helped me with my makeup, but I wanted, I would twist my face out of shape. Uh, I'd end up with a headache after shooting, but the other thing I did was bought some vampire fangs and cut the fangs off. So 
those aren't my teeth. I just was after something that would make me look a little different. And then, and then uh, Heinzman, uh, he used to demonstrate his walk, which he stole from Boris Karloff. You know, he would he 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 would admit that I he patterned his walk walk dragging his foot after I think in the mummy or something. Walking the head, Boris. Yeah, walking but, the dead walk or something. Yeah, but he, he Heinzman, if, he, if Heinzman were here, he'd walk. Yeah, he did tell the story around on this very stage. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, the other thing was that there's how much can they do? Can they use a club? Can they hit somebody with a rock? You know, we're, we, we were working out those things to him, killing. So when it came time, well, somebody, he has to try to get to the girl in the car. And George said, well, pick up a rock. He said, well, George, I, can I do that? I'm supposed to be weak. <laughs> he said, just pick up, pick up the rock and smack the wind up. <laughs> huh? Are you sure I can do that, George? He says, have it. <laughs> so Heisman, I'm George is in the car with the camera, and I'm behind George because I was assistant cameraman most of the time. I wasn't doing something else, and uh, <laughs> Heisman hits the window a bunch of times and it won't break. And then he just bang, and the glass comes flying, and the rock comes flying. And if we would have busted our one camera of the shooting, you know, <laughs> we would have been over, but luckily that didn't happen. So those kind of things, you know. In the end, Jack, uh, what was his name? Jack Ligo? No, the one that worked for Hardman, Jack. Uh, Jack Gibbons. Gibbons. He's the one with the club. You know, and he's, he starts bashing the club mindlessly against the, the wall of the farmhouse. So. And, and how about bringing you back from in the original script, the brother doesn't come back. We assume he's been killed. So I don't know if you want to tell about that. Well, uh, the the irony of it, obviously, uh, Barbara has been yearning for in her catatonia. Uh, Johnny has the keys. We have to get to Johnny uh, throughout the entire film. So it made sense that the the irony would be that. Johnny does come back eventually, and it, I think it proved to be a pretty shocking moment in the film. But it, it was again one of the things you, you, you're working it out as as you go. The reason that I made such a big deal about the driving gloves at the beginning of the film was because we knew from a storytelling point of view that at the end of the film, when when Johnny does come back. He's going to be, it's, it's going to be night, number one. His dark glasses are going to be gone. Uh, and I wanted to give him a wardrobe signature so that the audience knew as soon as this face appears in the doorway and the gloved hand comes up, bang, that's Johnny. And what happened? He grabs her and drags her out of the house. And uh, it turned out to be a, a pretty, um, from a storytelling point, a pretty significant uh, story point, and it all worked out well. Uh, but you know, it was it was all worked out kind of. We 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 labored over everything. Would the audience buy it if he comes back, or has his head been his brain been destroyed and all that? Because if the audience doesn't buy it, buy it, then the whole movie's blown. They they're not suspending belief anymore. You know. Yeah, especially so, when he falls down and hits his head to begin and, with. But that attention to detail was all part of that education I talked about earlier of doing all these hundreds of commercial films and industrial right. films and every kind of thing. That we had to sweat every detail all the time. And we got so used to doing that, you know, that Russ was was thinking that out very precisely because maybe they haven't seen Johnny for 90 minutes. What if they didn't recognize him? Then they didn't get the gag, you know? And uh, speaking of like continuity and everything, brings up another little story that I know from talking to you guys, knowing you guys for 25 years. But it concerns Gary, who I haven't known for 25 years, but one of the only ca almost casual leads on the film oh, no. had to do with continuity, <laughs> did it not? When Ben lights the chair, throws it out, they had cut the scene, we're gonna put it out because they only had one chair. Poor Gary went to put it out and you basically caught your sleeve on fire, did you not? <laughs> caught my whole arm on fire. Um, 
Okay, all right. Has anyone not heard this story before? <laughs> before I go through it. All right, well, I'll, I'll do an abbreviated. Yeah, as we all been saying, we all wore many different hats during the production. And, um, you know, because there wasn't any sound on this particular thing, I was relegated to be the special effects person that, <laughs> you know, that dealt with the chair fire. And uh, we did a take. And uh, George wasn't happy with the blocking. There was just something that he didn't like about it. So it was like a half hour, something like that, in, in between doing take one and take two. Maybe it was direction with Ben, whatever. And um, so the chair was put out, and it's just sitting there while this, the detail is being worked out. And uh, so, okay, George is ready, we're ready to shoot. And I had been all over this thing. You know, I was certain that it was dead out and uh, of course when you're using gasoline as a vehicle to, <laughs> to to make the fire happen gasoline has a funny way of finding itself to the tiniest little ember <laughs> and just exploding and so there i am like pouring gasoline onto this thing and all of a sudden it just goes and i I jerked back and gasoline ran down me and my <laughs> arm. And uh, fortunately, Heinzman, uh, I think, might have had some, um, uh, I don't know, volunteer fire something, army, wherever and wherever it came right from. There, right? Yeah. He right. And he just tackled me to the ground and rolled <laughs> it out. And, and, and if, 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 it, if it wasn't for that sort of instantaneous thinking, I might be in a different physical position than I am today. It just so. occurred to me that, you know, I volunteered to be set on fire. I'm the one who <laughs> set on fire in the Molotov cocktail sequence, and that was real gasoline. If I'd have known he was so willing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the whole point. We went through all that. Why didn't you run the camera, George? You know, we could have used it somehow. No. So what happens to me, that my big scene doesn't get filmed. And then in the end, when I have a chance to be in the film, they, they do it all to prints and they make them real grainy and you can't tell who I am. But I was one of the posse members. I do call myself a badass posse member. Um, well, that that threw Ben on the map. Still with the books. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I'm not gloriously, because <laughs> they were all sort of treated, shot through gauze and all that. But anyway, that that that's why I don't I don't have a screen credit on that. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I think all Richard is the first one that's shot in the head. You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> he had to show when when they're they're fighting over the gun and the, you know the, the side window thing, and then he gets shot in the <clears throat> chest. We wanted to show that you could kill him with a shot through the head, so he gets shot I think twice, and he doesn't. He reels back, but he doesn't fall. He only falls when the bullet hits him in the head, so then the audience knows ah oh, they can be killed by a shot through the head. Now you guys got pretty lucky as far as it goes because I know there's not a lot of unused film. You know, you, you're seeing, we did, we, we liked it, we used it, we liked it, we used it. But you guys beat the MPAA on their new rating system too. So there wasn't a whole lot of going like, you know, we had a lot of problem with censorship, especially in the 80s where they were literally cutting seconds out of scenes. But you guys just squeaked in b b before that rating system. So there were, it, you know, so you can get it out unrated. And, you know, there might have been some problems. I know there was problems with, you know, distributors, whatever, but still in the long run, it really worked in your favor, too, because you just squeaked through that new rating system. Yeah, now that was the district where you got yeah. okay. the, the MPAA rating system went into effect uh, in uh, November of 1968. Uh, Night of the Living Dead was released October 1st of 1968 so we beat the rating system by uh, by a month uh, it's likely that had the MPAA rated it they would have probably rated it an X um, now whether that would have been good or bad who knows but um, well at the time X didn't mean porn it meant adult 
Yeah. Um, then they, the, the, then the adult films took it over and said, "Oh, this isn't just adult; it's yeah. triple X." That's where yeah. the triple X rating came from. Right. And then they created the R rating because people were like, "Everyone thinks I just made a porno movie." So, but at the time, X just meant you had to be an adult; you couldn't be a kid to see it. Cannibalism in a film would get you an X. <laughs> <laughs> So we had a tr trivia question last night that Reader's Digest actually said, you know, don't watch the movie. It, you might resort to cannibalism. What the hell is that? <laughs> really? I watched the black and white horror movie and I'm gonna eat my brother? I, am serious. You know, I always say that people ask about that nude zombie, you know, and I say, I don't know anything about it. I was scared to look at her because what if it turned me on? I'd have to spend the rest of my life in cemeteries and. <laughs> These guys, Carl and Marilyn, have to be pretty good friends. And Carl and, Carl, and, and when she, Carl and, and Marilyn did several wastelands early on, and we, I used to tell people it was it was Marilyn just so they'd come up and ask her about. It. She's like, "Damn, you can't stop telling me why was the nude zone." We have time for the audience to ask any questions. We, we, yeah, we've been here an hour already. But yes, if you guys, we can. Do, I, I scheduled this on purpose for an hour and a half thinking these guys would tell some stories. So we always limit it to an hour, but go ahead. I'm curious how life changed for you after the movie. We got poorer. <laughs> 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 broke. Uh, uh, not at all. Uh, <laughs> not until years later, obviously. Well, they, the distributor wasn't paying us, and that went on for months, but the theaters weren't paying them. We were starting to learn how difficult, even though we had a smash hit picture, you know, it opened with only 17 prints or so in Pittsburgh, and then it did such bang up business that it moved across to Cleveland, New York, Philadelphia, everywhere it went, it was doing big business, but we went about nine months, didn't we, Russ, before we collected anything, and then we got one big check. And, and, then, and, and that's the last time we saw a big check from them. They started ripping us off right from the beginning. So meantime, we had run our lab bills up, our bills with creditors and everything else, and we were stone broke. Jefferson Airplane got in touch with us and wanted to do music for our next movie, and it was like, what next movie? We're broke. They invited us to Philadelphia to meet them and at their concert, and we didn't have two dimes to rub together, and none of us went. <laughs> so that kind of stuff would happen. All of a sudden, we're getting famous and we're broke. Now, if you, you know, Spike Lee comes along, if he does it exactly the way we did it, raises money from friends and neighbors, makes a movie that on a very low budget, and the next thing they pop up and he gets six million bucks for his next movie. Same with the Cone Brothers. Nobody was popping us to help give us anything. So we had to make our next several movies on on almost the same money we made Night of the Living Dead with. So that's the way it went. It, you know. it, it has changed my life significantly in that um, we I never considered myself anything special. All I wanted to do since I was six, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be an actor before I really knew what an actor was. To that extent, uh, my, my career before Night of the Living Dead and after has been very gratifying. The post Night of the Living Dead has been especially gratifying because of, and I mean it sincerely, because of you guys. It has changed my life in so many significant It's impossible to not have an occurrence in your life like Night of the Living Dead and its, pos and its popularity and not have a profound effect on me as an individual. And I guess when I answered not at all, I think our, our daily lives went on unaltered you know but we had to jump right back into business and, and, and do exactly what we did fast forward you know 25 years later uh, you know it's the, the, how many people do we have in this room listening to us babble you know that's pretty impressive you know uh, and, and so yes I concur with everyone else I'm sure on this panel you know, you guys have carried the ball from there, and uh, it's an honor to be able to, you know, come and talk to you and actually have you listen and care. And uh, 
So that that's altered my life without question. What's odd about it is we talk about the budget and everyone pitching in, and and, and, it, and it is true with it. These guys, you know, they put everything they had into it, and it, and never really got anything out of it to the point that you know it was on such a low budget. You were stretched so thin. I can bring Russ into this again with another funny story that you guys couldn't even afford your first 35 print. Did you not have to? Did you not win a game of chess to to, to get that first print made? Well, what?